So this is, today I'll be talking a lot about blood pressure. Um, in disclosure, I have several grants from the NIH related to measuring blood pressure in pregnancy. I also adjudicate endpoints for a clinical trial unrelated to anything related to what we're talking about today. So a couple of learning objectives for everyone here in person and online, and I, I look forward to questions later. I'm going to talk a little bit about epidemiology, um, how hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are associated with maternal morbidity and mortality, particularly in the United States. I'm going to talk a little bit about diagnostic thresholds and blood pressure treatment goals for hypertension in pregnancy because they do differ a little bit than um, for non-pregnant adults. I'm going to talk about first and second line therapies for treating hypertension in pregnant and lactating people. And I hope you will uh, come away with feeling a little more comfortable prescribing contraception for uh, women with hypertension. Uh, it's something I certainly didn't learn about at all in my cardiology training. Um, and I think it's an important thing that we should all um, feel comfortable doing. Um, this has been touched on by several speakers already. Um, hypertensive disorders complicate about 1 in 10 pregnancies, globally are responsible for about 16 percent of maternal deaths, and they can manifest in many ways, including maternal stroke and eclampsia, um, placental abruption, and complications for the baby as well. Um, and hypertension, as Dr. Bond uh, initially just alluded to, is de deadly in pregnancy and not just during pregnancy. Actually, in the first week postpartum is when we see most of the complications and maternal deaths related to hypertension. The first month is when we see deaths relating from stroke, which is often a, a manifestation of poorly controlled hypertension. And then really in the uh, the remaining months to year postpartum is when manifestations of cardiomyopathy, peripartum cardiomyopathy related to preeclampsia in particular tend to manifest and cause, uh, unfortunately, maternal mortality. And so I think it's really important, as Dr. Bond mentioned, to always take a thorough pregnancy history and keep that in the back of your mind when you're uh, assessing patients with any sort of cardiovascular risk, risk factors, and presentation symptoms concerning for cardiovascular disease. Um, as has been mentioned by many of the speakers today, maternal mortality in the United States is abysmal. These are our racial disparities geographically across the United States overall. And these, you can see the striking and horrifying increased maternal mortality ratio for non-Hispanic black women. Um, and as was mentioned, and you know, particularly here in Arizona, it's not just non-Hispanic black women who face increasingly high rates of mortality. Um, American, Indian, Alaskan Native individuals also have striking racial disparities in their pregnancy-related death rates. Um, and so I'm going to shift a little bit to talking about hypertension and when we're treating hypertension in pregnant patients, we really are balancing risks and benefits, not only for mom, but also for baby or babies. And so this is always something that's in the back of our head when we're thinking about benefits and risks of tight blood pressure control. Um, and these are some of the things that are, are, we're always weighing. Um, so, uh, you know, as an, a very evidence-based person, and um, as Dr. Hayes said earlier, you know, I'm sort of the checklist type A type of person. So, you know, this is my go-to. What do the guidelines say? So in 2017, the ACC, AHA, and many, many organizations updated our guidelines for um, prevention, detection, evaluation, and management of high blood pressure in adults. And so, you know, I really am most focused on pregnancy. So I skip immediately to what do they say about treating hypertension in pregnancy. And they say, oh, it's beyond the scope of this guideline to really talk about it. We'll make two recommendations for you. One, if women have hypertension and become pregnant or are planning to become pregnant, you should titrate their medications and transition them to methyl dopa, nifedipine, or labetalol. And two, which really has a, a high level of evidence um, and is a contraindication for harm, women with hypertension who become pregnant should not be treated with ACE inhibitors, ARBs, or direct renin inhibitors because of concerns for teratogenicity. Uh, and that's really what they said to us. So, um, and they recommend going back to what ACOG has um, already put in their guidelines. And so, I'm going to break down for you today a little bit about blood pressure measurement and diagnosing hypertension in pregnancy. 
So again, different than other adults, when we're talking about diagnosing hypertension in pregnancy, we only have data about using office blood pressure. And the thresholds for pregnant uh, patients, pregnant persons, I try not to say pregnant women because as we've learned today, we should be very thoughtful about our words. Um, the guidelines haven't changed. So the diagnostic criteria for hypertension in a pregnant person is still 140 over 90. It did not lower to the 135 over 80 or 130 over 80, depending on the societies. And we really think about two thresholds. We have hypertension and then we have severe hypertension, which is a medical emergency where the systolic and or diastolic are greater than 160 over 110. Um, similar to non-pregnant adults, we want to always verify these um, blood pressure measurements. And so every pregnant person who comes to any prenatal um, visit should have a blood pressure measured so that we can trend these values over time. And technically for hypertension, there should be elevations in at least two separate occasions. The exception is when we're concerned about severe hypertension, which is a medical emergency, we need to repeat and confirm that and treat it emergently within 15 to 30 minutes and hopefully initiate therapies within 30 to 60 minutes. And I'll just you know, put it out there that we don't really have recommendations for out-of-office blood pressure or thresholds for diagnosis because the data is not out there. That's one of the things that I'm personally working on fixing, um, but hopefully other people in the room and online will be encouraged to join this as well and, and help build the evidence base so that we can say, like we can for non-pregnant individuals, a blood pressure in the office is equivalent to this blood pressure at home, is equivalent to this blood pressure on ambulatory. And hopefully we can augment our diagnostic criteria going forward. Um, the other thing I'll say about blood pressure measurement that I also didn't really learn about in any of my training is how to measure blood pressure. You know, we are all used to sort of our, I've recently converted to Epic and this like crazy schedule and timeline and everybody's tracking every moment of time. And the most important thing that we're basing so many decisions on is this blood pressure measurement that and I experience this too when I go to my physician's office and you know they're, they're 30 minutes late, I'm angry, I get rushed into a room, they slap a cuff over my sweater, they're talking to me, have you gained weight, are you smoking, are you doing this? And you know, so every little box can be checked in three minutes. To really measure blood pressure properly, we need to do a lot of things. We should have people seated for at least five minutes in a comfortable temperature room, um, especially for our pregnant patients who often need to have a full bladder for some of their tests. We need them to have their blood pressure measured on an empty bladder. Uh, back feet should be supported, arms should be supported. No caffeine, no smoking for at least an hour before uh, those measurements. And so just some things to keep in mind for folks who have the ability to change some of their practice patterns. These are simple changes you can implement in your workflow to really help improve the quality of data and our patients' direct outcomes. Um, the other thing that I'll mention is, as Dr. Bond said, there are a lot of changes that occur physiologically to the vasculature during pregnancy. As a result, a lot of our blood pressure measurement devices are not necessarily accurate because the algorithms that they use in these automated devices don't always work when we have these high cardiac output states uh, and changes in vascular resistance. So these are some devices that have been shown to be uh, validated for accuracy in pregnant persons. Um, I encourage you to go back to your offices and see what you have. And if you are working with a lot of pregnant patients, encourage your healthcare system to make sure that the device is um, one that is acceptable for um, medical accuracy in pregnancy. Another difference between uh, classifying hypertension in pregnancy is we think about uh, gestational age. And so if the hypertension predates pregnancy, occurs before 20 weeks of gestation, or persists more than six weeks postpartum, we call that chronic hypertension. If it occurs later in pregnancy, it, it's either gestational hypertension or can be preeclampsia or eclampsia if there's some target organ involvement as well. 
There we go. So uh, a quick foray into what if we were to apply the diagnostic criteria for uh, that ACC AHA changed in 2017 to pregnant patients. And so it would really be calling people who are currently called prehypertensive stage one hypertension instead. And so we looked, actually this is data from Kaiser Permanente, um, we looked at changing the thresholds for criteria, and actually, not surprisingly, if you lower the threshold, we have about a 17.8% increase in the diagnosis of hypertension, so a 10% increase in chronic hypertension, a 7.8% increase in gestational hypertension. But more importantly, we found that women who, or persons who were reclassified were more likely to have preeclampsia and eclampsia. So the, the women who had previously been called gestational hypertension because they crossed that threshold after 20 weeks and were now called chronic hypertension because they met a threshold earlier, not at the 140 uh, threshold, really had high, high rates of preeclampsia. We're probably, oops, probably on a bad pathway. Um, and we actually found, you know, statistically, we found almost a 21% net reclassification improvement. So better identified nearly one in five women who were at risk for developing preeclampsia and eclampsia. And importantly, I said we're always balancing maternal and fetal and neonatal events. Um, we didn't find that lowering that threshold had an impact on adverse I don't know why I keep pushing the button too prematurely, sorry. Uh, didn't really affect adverse neo fetal or neonatal events because that was our other concern. If we used a lower threshold, would we see, and this is not randomized, this is all retrospective, would we see um, in changes in the fetus? And we did not. Um, a little bit about now shifting gears to treat hypertension in pregnancy and um, preeclampsia prevention. So these are uh, the ACOG treatment recommendations, both for initiation and what blood pressure goals should be for pregnant persons. Um, and we, we can talk about this perhaps uh, as part of the panel, whether these are um, correct and what to do if someone's actually already taking medications before they become pregnant. Should you stop them? Should you continue them? Should you see what the blood pressure does over time? What if your patient has comorbidities like renal disease, diabetes? Um, there are There is some wiggle room here and treating to a lower threshold may certainly be appropriate. Uh, two things to note are that weight loss and extremely low sodium diets are not recommended as first line therapy for blood pressure management in pregnancy, but moderate exercise can and should be continued. Um, these are our mainstay medications for pregnant persons, really first line. In my clinic, or labetalol nifedipine, I rarely, if ever, use methyl dopa. I include it because in certain situations, in certain countries, it's the only medication out there. Um, and it is certainly one with a very long and um, safe track record. It is the only medication that actually has child outcomes for up to a decade or more postpartum. Um, other medications that we often use in patients who have difficult to control blood pressure, hydralazine, um, but just don't use that in isolation because of concerns for reflex tachycardia. We'll occasionally use low-dose thiazides as well. Again, the one hopefully take home, uh, don't use ACE inhibitors, ARBs, direct renin inhibitors, or mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists in this group. And it's not just early on. Actually, the higher risk in ACEs and ARBs is in the third trimester, sort of contrary to what you would think. It's not necessarily just related to renal genesis. It also has to do with oligohydramnios. And globally, just want, you know, knowing that we're broadcasting all over the place, I'd like to keep this slide in and just sort of show that depending on where you are and where you practice, the initiation and treatment targets differ wildly. And I think this is because we have such a paucity of data. Different societies have interpreted what's out there more or less aggressively and more or less um, rigorously. Um, Hopefully soon we'll have the results of CHAP, which is similar to SPRINT, but in pregnant individuals and going to let us know if we should treat to a lower target of 140 over 90 compared to 160 over 105, and I eagerly await that. Um, I talked a little bit about um, severe hypertension being a medical emergency and um, really mean that 
uh, you know, we talk about what are practical things that we can take home today. This will save lives, and these are the first line therapies IV labetalol, immediate release, PO nifedipine, IV or IM hydralazine um, or hydralazine drips. In patients who are also presenting with heart failure, nitroglycerin drips are very useful to help treat the pulmonary edema, and magnesium sulfate really to prevent eclampsia and treat seizures in women who have severe preeclampsia or eclampsia or who are on that spectrum. Um, and a little bit about managing severe hypertension preeclampsia, some red flags to keep an eye out for, really pulmonary edema, new onset of headache, visual changes. Um, we are constantly monitoring labs for um, HELP syndrome, um, and really just thinking about what are the platelets, what are the LFTs doing, how are the kidneys doing over time. Um, and, and you know, this is where the whole team is important. Everybody who's going in and assessing these patients, asking about any new signs or symptoms. And listening, what, you know, we heard these horrible stories. We have to listen to our patients. We have to listen to their family who know them, who know better than any of us what's their normal. This, you know, when someone says, this is not my wife, spouse, partner, this is something's going on, they're not acting right, we have to act on that um, and, and, you know, really take that to heart. Um, and again, so I, I showed this a little bit. So the other thing about hypertension in pregnancy is that it's dynamic. About a quarter of people with gestational hypertension will go on to develop preeclampsia and eclampsia. Depending on the patient population, more than 40% in some settings will go from chronic hypertension to develop superimposed preeclampsia, eclampsia. And aspirin is really one of the only things we have that has been shown in, in this country to um, improve or prevent some of that progression to preeclampsia. This was just updated two months ago now. I keep saying last month, but it's already almost Thanksgiving. Um, the USPSTF now further has sort of re-endorsed recommending the use of low-dose aspirin to prevent preeclampsia after 12 weeks of gestation and hopefully before 20 weeks of gestation in persons who are at high risk. Um, and chronic hypertension is a high risk factor. You can see here the other high risk factors, the moderate risk factors. It's really recommended if you have two or more moderate risk factors to take a low dose aspirin and think about it if patients have one of these moderate risk factors. Um, and for uh, individuals who have had a prior uncomplicated term delivery and no risk factors, uh, low dose aspirin has not been proven to provide any benefit for preeclampsia prophylaxis. And um, just like the blood pressure guidelines, uh, aspirin prophylaxis guidelines met very different, uh, vary by countries, also because the dose of aspirin differs by different countries. So we have 81 here. Uh, many countries in which the trials were done actually have 75 milligram doses of aspirin. Um, but the one thing I will say is chronic hypertension is noted to be a high risk factor recognized by ACOG as well as our European and NICE counterparts across the pond. Um, a little bit on postpartum and long-term health. We heard about the fourth trimester. Again, I just plea to listen to your patients. Headache, visual changes in association with hypertension should really raise your suspicion for postpartum preeclampsia. Um, and you know, uh, many of us were trained to know that when the, the placenta is delivered, you can't get preeclampsia anymore. That, that cures it, and we know now that that's not true. Um, and I think a lot of missed and near misses occur in these situations where women's blood pressure really goes up in the post short-term postpartum period. Um, Pregnancy-related hypertension should resolve pretty quickly, hopefully within three months. Um, and we need to think about, our next speaker is going to talk about how do we give warm handoffs and take care of these individuals and monitor their blood pressure over time. Uh, we also heard about how these are risk factors for future development of chronic hypertension as well as other cardiovascular disease. And I'll just show you a little bit. So uh, this is some work from the Hispanic Community Health Survey. Um, and we looked at women who and their blood pressure over the six years between one pregnancy. Women who didn't have any hypertension or diabetes either before or during their pregnancy had very stable blood pressure over those six years. Women who had gestational hypertension or diabetes had an increase in their systolic blood pressure of three and a half millimeters of mercury over six years, which is a pretty rapid increase. But individuals who had 
diabetes or hypertension before they got pregnant and then also developed either gestational hypertension or diabetes had a nearly 20 millimeter of mercury increase in their systolic blood pressure over 60 years. This is a mind boggling increase and really shows you how vulnerable these individuals are. And you know these, these are people who are connected enough that they actually are in an ongoing NHLBI funded cohort and so you would think, oh, they must have access to care. This, this is not blood pressure measured off of medication. This is the real world. These are people who we're just not doing a good job treating their risk factors, finding out if they have risk factors. So, you know, again, we, we can and should be doing better for these individuals. Um, uh, people often want to know what, what's safe when I'm breastfeeding. I, I, you know, there's a lot of concerns about... Um, what, what should we do? What can we do? All medications, it really except for propranolol and nifedipine, are excreted into breast milk in small amounts. These are a sort of short list of some of the preferred agents we use. I would say, again, caution with methyl dopa, especially when we're concerned about postpartum depression. Also, um, there's not really data for ARB use uh, in breastfeeding as well. And then just Two slides about contraception for women in hyper, with hypertension. This is a sort of breakdown of the three tiers of contraception. For women with hypertension, the tier one and the tier three um, really have no contraindications. For tier two, which combined hormonal contraception, uh, CHC, uh, falls in there. There is definitely an increased risk of thromboembolism among CHC users with hypertension that is even higher in those who smoke or are age greater than 35. Um, for women with hyper, or individuals with hypertension and blood pressure greater than 140 over 90, we should be careful using combined hormonal contraceptions. And blood pressure that's poorly controlled over 160 over 100 is an absolute contraindication to CHC use. Um, emergency contraception and hypertension, there are really no concerns about safety. So, you know, this is an important thing to think about, to talk to our patients about, to encourage them to feel comfortable coming to us when these situations arise. And as has been alluded to, um, preeclampsia and gestational hypertension are really associated with heightened risks of all sorts of future cardiometabolic disease, including stroke, heart failure, diabetes, uh, ischemic heart disease. So we need to screen and ask about this. Um, just hopefully this is an easy take home slide for folks. Think about preconception assessment, medication adjustment in individuals with hypertension, aspirin for prevention, how to manage during pregnancy. Our goal blood pressure should certainly be less than 160 over 110. Labetalol and nifedipine are your go-tos and severe hypertension is a medical emergency. Postpartum, think about you know, readjusting medications. Most are safe for use in uh, lactation. Talk to your patients about contraception. Talk to them about risk modification. And that's all, thanks.